Good morning. Let's all stand to our feet to worship the Lord. You look so good, my goodness gracious. Welcome to the cause. Hope you've brought your dancing shoes. Let's sing this together. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough. And you, that you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. So we see. Together, mm, Lord, there's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing that's better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not afraid to sing this. Now I'm not.
Somebody sing this with me. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. No, there's nothing. Her voice. It's better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Absolutely nothing. Hallelujah. We sing, Lord. There's nothing. It's better than you, Lord. There's nothing. It's better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Hallelujah. Let's lift up a shout of praise in this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Isn't God so good? One more chance, one more chance. Isn't God so good? Yes, amen. Welcome to the Cause Church. So glad to have you here. I want to say hello to our live stream viewers, wherever you are. If you're still wearing your PJs, congratulations. You have made it in life. Um, could you hear the love in my voice when I said that? I hope so. I love you. Um, <clears throat> it feels a lot like I'm talking to Phil, our, our, our very faithful cameraman. I love you, Phil. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning. How are you doing today? Good, good. You look really good today. She's the only one that ever says it in this entire church. All three services, one person responds, so do you. I try really hard, you know what I'm saying, to wear nice clothes. I'm always really sweaty, but uh, I, I try my best, okay? Anyways, somebody say, he tries his best. Hey, praise God. You know, you, you understand me. Okay. Well, welcome to the cause. So good to have you today. Is expecting God to do something today. Amen? You know, every time we come together, we should come with an expectancy. Right? Uh, I've noticed in my time in ministry, oh uh, my goodness, it'll be 10 years. In six years, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming up on eight and a half years. And <laughs> uh, I've noticed that God responds to expectancy. Amen? Now, what do I mean by expectancy? Expectancy is when you come into this room knowing, knowing you're going to encounter Jesus. Because the word says where two or three or more are gathered, also he is there. Right? So if the, is the word of God true, then he's here. Amen? That's step one. Step two is that you're not going to walk out the same way that you walked in, trusting and believing that God's encounter will change something in you. Amen? Mm, mm. Did that convict some of you? That got real quiet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Well, you know what? I just invite you all to lift your expectancy today. Uh, let's never take for granted the opportunity to worship the Lord. And since we're in the house of the Lord today, uh, I'm going to urge all of you to take a step today. And, um, and let's, let's worship the Lord. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> before we continue on, first thing I want to do is recognize this man right here. This is Jacob Rush. I didn't tell him I was going to do this. Jacob Rush has been here for how long? Six years? 56 years. <clears throat> and he was a part of PG's old church, right? Yes, in Ocean City. So he's an Ocean City guy. It makes him very strange, okay? Uh, <laughs> anyways, he broke his wrist um, very faithfully serving in youth a few months ago, and today is his first Sunday back on the, on the worship team. Also, a few days ago was his birthday. He turned 16. Just kidding. How old did you turn? 23? 4? 24. Praise God. All right. Well, uh, just building community here. That's what I'm doing. And I'd like for you to do the same. For the next 30 seconds, get out of your aisle and say hello to two or three people if you don't mind.
Okay, too much community, you guys. <laughs> too much talking. I did ask for it. <laughs> That's the last time ever. Take it away from our time for worship. Just kidding. All right. You excited to worship the Lord today? All right. Let's, uh, let's focus in. God is so good. How many of us believe that he is uh, the God of miracles? That he cast out all fear? Amen. Our God did not give us a spirit of fear. Instead, he gave us a sound mind and several other things. But the word says, he, he said, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but a sound mind couple other things. The sound mind is what I want to point out. He said, but that means instead. That means the opposite of fear or, or fear means not being in a sound mind. The opposite of fear is having a sound mind. Amen. God is saying, believe my word today. Don't stand in fear. Stand in faith. Amen. Do you receive that today, Cos Church? We lift up a shout of praise on it. your voice and give thanks for freedom, for freedom, for liberty. Hallelujah. And he has placed us in a place of victory, that we do not have to bow to every attack from the enemy, that we can move forward in progress. Hallelujah. And he's got a call for every single life, that he split the sea so we could walk right through it. Lift your voice, God's church. She's so worthy. Thank you, Jesus.
Lift your voice, God's church, I'm no longer. lift our hands on the cross this place this is a position of worship it's a position of surrender the word uh, commands us to lift holy hands you know it makes this this reality of when when you're a, a child when you want your father to pick you up you go to your father and you put your hands in the air and you say pick me up man this is what this is we're saying i just want to know you more lord i want to be closer to you I'm going to lay my head on your chest and hear your heart beat. And in that place, there is no fear. And so I just want to speak over somebody today. And we're going to take this and sing that chorus one more time. But I want to speak over somebody today that he cast out that spirit of fear. You no longer have to live chained to it anymore. You may have been raised a certain way in a home full of anxiety or strife. So therefore, now that you're out of that home, you have been doing whatever it takes to be successful, and that has led you to a place of fear. Whether if, if you're in success or in failure, if you're in lack, if you're in health, if you're in sickness, you're in fear, and that is not God's way. If you are unsure about what's happening tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, whether in your home or nationally or internationally, the Lord said, I did not give you a spirit of fear. In fact, he says that I am the author and giver of peace, the opposite of fear. And so, I want us to take this. It's, it's, it's kind of on our shoulders to recognize what the Lord has done for us. released us from that spirit of fear. We don't have to live there anymore. What are you going to do with that information? Latch on to it today. If you're living in fear today, if you came today nervous and anxious, lift your voice as we sing this. Sing it above the voice of fear. Sing with me. That I'm no longer a slave. Impossible is reaching out to make me 
my church begin to lift your voice in worship of who he is, the one true king, the God of miracles, the God of revival, the God who makes dead things live again. Hallelujah. 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 singing this? Is this your song? Or is your song, what am I going to do? I have no idea. This was it. This job, I needed that so bad. Or is God your provider? Is God still the God of miracles? Is his word that says by his stripes you are healed, are healed. Is that the truth? Whatever you're facing today, let's, let's twist. Instead of the voice of fear, let's listen to the God of miracles. Can we sing this again in the face of what you're facing? We sing together. Mm. I believe in you. I believe. church. Yes, I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of me. Hallelujah. Jesus, there's power in that. Do not be afraid. 
all you can say is holy. There's, that is the truth. But lift your voice. Make prayer and supplication here in this place. church that worships. Lord, you, you, you brought me here from Alabama. You placed me at a church that worships you, making my job as the worship pastor so easy. Lord, I thank you for every person that is in this place because they have opened their hearts to you and their mouths and their hands. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. Bless them. I thank you for your protection, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We ask that a hedge of protection will be placed around every person here, and that your presence would go with them wherever they go. In fact, it would go before them and set the table. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we adore you. We're so thankful for you. We hope that our worship has been a sweet-smelling aroma to you. Let's put a smile on your face. Let every heart be prepared for your word to come forth. Praise you, Jesus. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Church, can you give up a shout of praise? Thank you so much for worshiping. You may be seated. We're going to show a Harvest Fair video. Check this out. College Church, how are you? Good, good. It is so nice to see all of you here this morning. In case you don't know, my name is Madison. I am the kids director here at the College Church, and I just want to welcome you this morning. If this is your first Sunday with us, I want to encourage you to fill out a Connect card on the back of your chair. If you fill it out and take it to our Connect Center right out here in the lobby, um, we will ha we have a free gift for you that includes a Dunkin' gift card, so you can fill that out and take that out um, there. You can also turn it around, and if you are interested in serving. You can check one of these boxes or you could also write a prayer request if you have um, a prayer or a need that you need to um, have prayer for. And you can also drop that off at the Connect Center. Um, we just want to welcome you this morning and um, we want to encourage you to follow us on so social media. Um, we have Facebook, Instagram, and you can also make a church community builder um, page. Um, our church community builder, that is something that we have here at The Cause and we send out weekly emails through it. Um, if you're a part of a serve team, a group, we also serve, uh, send out emails that way as well. And so we encourage you to get a church community builder page. Um, coming up, as you saw, for our harvest fair, our annual harvest fair is happening this Saturday, October 30th from 4 to 6 p.m. Yeah, we're really excited. And so um, I want to encourage you. Come on out, have fun with us. We're going to have games, ponies, popcorn, cotton candy. It's going to be a blast. And so I encourage you, bring your family. Um, we will have games for all, all kids, all ages. We'll have food. We'll, we're just going to join together as a community and hang out and have some fun. You can also, I encourage you, our ushers will have these Harvest Fair invite cards. I encourage you to grab a couple and hand them out to a couple people this week. Maybe a stranger in a grocery store, or maybe you have family that you just want to invite. This is a great way to get them connected to a church, and then we can invite them back on a Sunday. Um, and so I encourage you to do that. And if you are still interested in volunteering and serving on that day, you can come and have um, meet with me after service. We will be having a volunteer meeting, just five minutes to just kind of walk through the day. 
Or you could also message me throughout this week and I can add you in somewhere. And so feel free to reach out for that. But we're really looking forward to it. So I, I encourage you, come on out. In just two weeks, November 5th through the 6th, yes, we will be in November in two weeks, um, our youth group will be going to YouthCon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're really excited to send them off. Um, and so if you have a child that's in youth, I encourage you to send them to this. It's a really powerful event. They will definitely get something out of it. Um, the cost is about $150, and that includes hotel, transportation, and the conference itself. And so we just encourage you to sign up. You can sign up at the um, Vertical Youth on Wednesday, or you can also sign up at our Connect Center today. And then there will be a mandatory parent meeting the Wednesday before for November 3rd, um, just kind of to talk to you parents. So following Vertical Youth on that Wednesday, we will have a parent meeting for that. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Pastor John or you can ask any one of us. Coming up on November 7th, we are having a celebration Sunday and we're super excited because we're gonna celebrate everything that God is doing here at the cause. And so we will be celebrating all our new members that are coming and joining our members. Um, and then we will also be doing baptism and baby dedication. And so if you feel like your next step is to get baptized, we encourage you to talk with one of us pastors and then we can get you signed up on CCB or you can go to our action page on our website and sign up through there. And then we also will be having baby dedication. And so if you just recently had a baby or within the past year or so, we encourage you to sign up and just dedicate your baby to um, the Lord. And that's just a way of saying that you're gonna be raising that child up to know who God God is and um, we do it here at the church to just kind of be able to encourage alongside of you to raise that child in the way of the Lord and so we encourage you come on out and if you're not it, um, partaking in any of these celebrate with us celebrate the people that are going to be taking this next step of baptism or baby dedication and so um, for either of those things you can sign up on our action page and so I, I encourage you come on out um, we have four ways you can give here at the college church you can text to give you can give in an envelope in the back of the room or you could give online or through our new cause church app and so i encourage you to um, give e either of those ways so i'm going to go ahead and pray over our offering and then we're going to get started with today Dear God, I just thank you for every person that here that is here at the cause this morning. God, I thank you for their giving. I thank you for their time, for their service. God, I thank you just for the people that you're bringing into the cause. I just lift up every single person that is here this morning that we would get something out of this service, God, because we know that you are here this morning. And so, God, I pray over this offering that you would bless it, you would send it out. And God, we lift up your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give it up for Madison. You ever noticed how much we clap in this church? You, who thinks we do that a lot? Okay. Well, we do. It's just, it's an interesting thing. Hey, so glad you're here this morning. And uh, hopefully you, you have a heart to receive from God. And I love church. I love meeting together. And, and we, have, uh, we have a special speaker this morning. Let me give you a little background because I take times like this to get, give you a, little, a lot of new people in the church. You don't under, know maybe uh, what we're affiliated with. But we are an Assemblies of God church, which is one of the largest denominations. It's a Pentecostal denomination. Go AG, right? And uh, they're all, they're all over the, we're all over the world, all over the United States. And uh, so to give you the background on what uh, Pastor Ben does, uh, in the Assemblies of God, in the state of three states, we're, fill, we're are in our network, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, there's about 350 Assembly of God churches. So you probably, there's about eight or nine in Howard County, Anne Arundel County, there's a lot, Baltimore. And so what that means, we have a district office in Gainesville, Virginia, and we have a district superintendent, which is the top dog. He's the big guy. Frank Potter, great guy. And uh, then second, we have Ben Rainey, who is with us this morning. He's the secretary treasurer. And so he, it's a, he's an elected official. And so, but a little background story, Ben has pastored two great churches in our, in our network. And uh, he's, a, he's a great guy, great friend. So can we just give him a warm welcome, Ben Rainey, as he comes and shares this morning. Put up. Praise the Lord. I am on. All right. Welcome to the house of God. So those are always my favorite words to put through the microphone first. I try to, I try to get that, set the, set the bar. Where are we? You know? 
So, good morning. It is great to be with you. I'm Pastor Ben, and uh, yes, my, my title is Secretary Treasurer. Does, doesn't that sound exciting? It's like riveting ministry. Every day it gets me out of bed. I get to be a Secretary Treasurer. And uh, this is like, uh, this would be like Secretary of State, right, or Secretary of Defense. Sometimes people introduce me as Frank Potter's Secretary. I think that has a different meaning, a different thing. And uh, so... My pleasure to be with you this morning. We've already had a great service, uh, round one, and so here we are, round two. I want to welcome those who are gathering online with us and uh, welcome you to participate in reading the Word today as we look at that together. Uh, I, uh, my heart is uh, going out to, to Heather, uh, who's home ill today, and uh, Heather, I, I wore my jacket for you. The story goes that I was at this meeting, and I stood up, somebody presented, and they said, do you have any questions? And uh, apparently, I'm told... I stood up, I I buttoned my jacket, I stepped to the microphone, and I presented my question, and she elbowed Pastor Greg and said, why can't you be put together like that, (laughs) you know? I I get it, I'm a tucked-in shirt in an untucked generation, and uh, and that kind of thing, but how many of you know if you're a secretary treasurer, you got to dress it up a little bit? I know I'm a little overdressed today, but thank you for your grace that way, and Heather, I am joining you in prayer that Pastor Greg will get saved today, (laughs) and uh, we will continue to believe together. My son Carson uh, is with me. I love traveling with my family, and he gets to be with me. My wife and girls are home in ministry uh, at our home church today, and uh, so I'm always thankful that he, is, uh, he rides with me, keeps me straight, and, uh, and I want to share this with you. I, my passion in ministry is serving men and women uh, who have a calling to ministry, and so I get to help educate them. I get to help them go through the credentialing process, the, the endorsement of a body of believers to say this, this person has studied to show themselves approved unto God. I, I get to do ongoing mentoring and training and developing, and so I love doing that. If you have been feeling that God is calling you to ministry, I'd love for you to find me today somewhere. Just pull me aside. I'd love to meet you and talk to you about that and see what, what God might uh, deposit in your heart today. Uh, about that calling. Well, would you take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 14, and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 23 today. You can, uh, you can read it on your phone if you don't have a Bible. If you have an analog Bible, flip to the second half of the Bible in the New Testament. You'll find the Gospel of Luke. Luke uh, is a, a gospel writer who, who did not know Jesus firsthand. He didn't, he didn't follow Jesus around in his earthly ministry. He was a physician by training, and so he wanted to create an orderly account of Jesus life and teaching he begins in the first section by introducing us to Jesus and his coming in the second section of Luke he records for us how Jesus begins announcing his kingdom to the poor and the the outcast and the marginalized but but the poor and the marginalized aren't always the same people did you know that we have a tendency to think that, that if somebody is poor, then they, they probably have problems, right? God hasn't blessed them. In fact, we, we like to celebrate when God blesses us with stuff as though somehow the stuff we have is God's blessing, hashtag blessed, right? And we love to kind of share that. In fact, I know nobody struggles with this. But in the Bible times, they actually thought that if you had more stuff, God loved you more. And I know nobody here holds that belief, now, come on. I mean, we struggle with this, don't we? Like, like if maybe God, God, I want God's blessing so I can have just a little bit more. And if God would be pleased with me, I could get a little bit more. We kind of, it's human nature to, to think that somehow we can twist God's arm or sometimes somehow we can manipulate him or get him to like, you know, be the, 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 the little genie in the bottle that we rub the bottle, he grants your wishes. You know, if I could just have more stuff. Well, Jesus ministers in the Gospel of Luke to people who were tax collectors, people who had plenty of money, They just didn't have anybody that wanted to hang out with them. They didn't have any friends or family. The family was like, stay away from us. You're collecting taxes for the Roman government from our own people and paying your salary with it. Stay away from us. So they had plenty of stuff. They just didn't have any people. And Jesus comes, proclaim his kingdom, not just to those who are poor, but to those who have plenty. And yet all of them are marginalized from a relationship with God. And so Jesus is coming, proclaiming his kingdom in the second section. Here in the third section, Luke focuses on a number of feasts. Sometimes Jesus is the host at the feast. Sometimes he's the guest. Today in in Luke 14, we're going to look at him as the guest of a feast. And and you know that culminates uh, coming to a table, a a feast 
of Passover on, on the night that he was betrayed to be crucified, where he gathered with his disciples to break the bread and pass the wine, to say, we're doing this as, as an act of what I'm about to do to lay myself down. Jesus has a lot to teach us at the table. And so I want to look at some things he teaches us today. Luke chapter 14, let's jump in at verse 1. One Sabbath, somebody say Sabbath. When Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. It's, it's the Sabbath day. It's one out of seven that's set apart as holy to God. That's in the top ten. Not everybody know all the commandments, uh, you know, all the law of God, but you know the top ten. You're, you're somewhat familiar. One of those was remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. No working on the day of rest. This is following God's own uh, example to us. When he created the earth over six days, on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And, and so he put it in the law. He said, look, if you're going to honor me and be my people, then you need to step back from your work and take a break on the Sabbath. And then they began to try to figure out what does it mean to like not work on the Sabbath? And depending on where you live, you got different answers. You might live in a town, because everybody's walking, right? You're not traveling to a lot of different towns. You, you might live in a town where the rabbi there says, well, you can walk to your mailbox and back, but if you go further than your mailbox, then you've worked. All right? Now, I'm contextualizing for us, right? I don't know that they had mailboxes in Jesus' day. If they did, it was probably really slow like ours, too. Okay. <laughs> USPS workers, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend. Okay. So it's a Sabbath day. He's been invited to come. It's supposed to be set apart as rest. So he must not have been staying very far from this house. He's on this short walk over to the house when he encounters this man. Verse 2, there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. And Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man... He healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus recognizes that the Pharisees and the experts of the law are going to have a problem with this. They, they regularly did. When he would heal people on the Sabbath, it messed with their theology. They're like, wait, we're not supposed to be working. This is supposed to be a day of rest. And then you just healed this person. Like, is, isn't that work? I don't know how much work it takes for Jesus, creator of the universe, to say, I'm going to set your body right. But they're, met, they're like, wait a minute. This can't be, like we can't work on the Sabbath, especially when you're coming to my house for dinner. The Pharisees got a problem with this. His job, the Pharisees' job, was to make sure that everybody in society was doing the right thing all the time. They believed that the reason that the Roman government had, had subjugated them was their ruler was because God was angry at them. They had messed up so bad that God would not love them. And so if they could just get things right, then God would stop being angry and they could go back to ruling themselves and not having to be subjects of Rome. Now look, this is another one of those Bible theologies, Bible time theologies. Can you imagine a day where people think like God would be angry with them if they don't live right enough? I mean, isn't that like archaic thinking? No! In the house today, some of you sitting right here have this theology. You think, if I could just live right enough, God would stop being mad with me. Some of you, we, we prayed about healing just a little bit ago. Some of you think that you're carrying disease in your body or you're waiting for healing because somehow God is not impressed with you enough yet. That somehow God doesn't love you enough yet. And, and some of you, listen, I'm just telling you from my own experience, you, you go through your heart and your mind, like, what am I doing wrong? I, I need to just get something else right. And if I could just get something else right, then God would stop being mad with me and everything could change. Could I just let you know something? That theology is in, informed by the fallenness of our humanity. That type of theology is often from some of the preaching that maybe you have heard growing up. Maybe it's informed by the preaching you heard from your mother in your living room, telling you how you ought to be and what you ought to do, or, or maybe by the relationship that you had with your father. Sometimes our faith is founded on the theology of our family experience, and knowing a, a, a God, a Father in heaven who lovingly is watching over us, even while we're walking through difficult times, 
And even while we're carrying in us something that, that he could take away, it's not because we have to earn his love and action. It's through those times that we learn we need to trust him. Here in this moment, Jesus decided he was going to do something about this man's need, and he was going to confront the Pharisees. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent, so taking hold of the man, he healed him. They haven't even gotten in the house yet, and Jesus is already uh, challenging his host. Then we go into verse 5. Then, the, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that, that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. And now Jesus goes from being watched to doing the watching. Verse 7, when he noticed, somebody say noticed. He noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you, somebody say both of you, they invited both of you, will come and say to you, give this person your seat, then humiliated, you will take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when you come, uh, when your host comes to you rather, he will say to you, friend, move up to the better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all of the other guests. Jesus uh, starts this dinner party. Uh, I, I think uh, my, this is not in the Bible. This is just my own, probably, this is what I surmise. Jesus is probably not real close to the head of the table. If he is, the story gets even worse. He's, he's probably near the foot of the table somewhere. Like, he's, he is the least of these, right, uh, around the table. He has been invited, but, but here he is. But, but here's what he noticed. He noticed that everybody who showed up for the party has come in looking for the best seat in the house. They've walked in. Now, now sometimes I think, as I think through this, men, I, some men have this way that they, they kind of want to move up the ladder, Right? in their vocation, in their respect, in the community, and that kind of thing. And, and how do they do that? They go to the company picnics and the, the, the after-work gatherings and those kinds of things. They, they want to rub shoulders with the, the, the people who are above them on the ladder. They want to be recognized for their work. They're looking forward to the, their performance reviews, and they want to keep climbing. And so it's very important to them to find a place where they're being recognized, you know. And so sometimes men are like that. But I find it interesting, Jesus doesn't just talk to the men who are jockeying for position at this table. He says, the host is going to come to both of you. It's the men and the women. I notice y'all came in. Look at now, now she's not climbing the ladder. She just wants to be noticed, right? And this is, I mean, this is, sometimes people are like this. Not every time, but sometimes people are like this. Have you ever noticed that? I've noticed this on my social media accounts, Right? That, uh, that when you get a selfie of Ben Rainey, I'm so, first of all, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. If, if 2020 taught me anything in Zoom, it's that people have to look at this all the time. I'm sorry. I apologize. Even there I'm in my office, I'm looking at that screen showing back at you. I'm like, raise your eyebrows. Raise your eyebrows. <laughs> Smile. Smile. Fairly serious guy, you know. If you get a selfie of me, it's like this. It's like a, just the headshot, like a mug shot. It's not, it's not lit very well, you know? You just get what you get. We took one at your office earlier. And Pastor Greg, I mean, he looks like Tom Cruise like he always does. And, uh, and I'm like, you know? I, I mean, just when it comes to, uh, like, that, uh, but there's these, these ladies, these women, friends of mine on social media. When I scroll through, their selfies are different. You ever notice that? The, the women's selfies are different because it's like the whole, it's the whole thing. It's like the shoes to the do's, you know? They want everybody to see. And w w women's selfies, they're always like on some balcony. And there's like some waves in the background. Little bluebirds are flying around their shoes. Like, and I look at this. I'm like, how do they get their selfies like that? It, it, clearly, they're not taking their own selfie. It's the selfie boyfriend. The, the selfie boyfriend, it's his job to carry her phone around to take her pictures in fact, she, she, he may have his own phone and be logged into her account to make sure that everything is being managed for her. It's his job. And look, some of you have graduated from selfie boyfriend to selfie husband. We're going to have an altar call for that in just a little while. You laugh, but listen, I've been following this one couple for over 10 years on social media. I have seen pictures of her 
all the time. I have yet to see a picture of him. <laughs> Why? Because it's his job to be taking the pictures, all the angles, make sure it's right, right? Why? Because she wants to be seen and she wants to be appreciated, right? And so whether you're jockeying for position at the table or you just want to get noticed, Jesus says when we're trying to promote ourselves up the table, it's a problem. Jesus says that's not how, that's not how my kingdom works, When we come to the table, we look for the lower place so that somebody can come tap both of you on the shoulder and say, move up to the better place. I just went to a wedding last week, and they had these little glass uh, centerpieces that had the table numbers written on them in like white Sharpie or something. But because it was glass and see-through, like you couldn't tell. And you know how awkward that is? Like, is this the table I'm supposed to be sitting at? You're terrified that somebody's going to be like, you're not supposed to be sitting there. There's a table for you out by the grill. (laughs) Both of you, verse 11, Jesus says, for all, he sums this up, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. I mean, this was a life, this was how Jesus lived. It struck so hard that his half-brother James wrote it this way in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I mean, this is a life message of Jesus. If you're going to be like me, you're going to follow me, you're going to know what my kingdom is like, we humble ourselves rather than try to exalt ourselves. Okay, that would make a great sermon, but let's keep going. Verse 12, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they may uh, invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. Do you notice what's happening here? Jesus confronts them before he gets in the house by healing on the Sabbath. He gets to the table and he insults all the guests. You all picked the wrong seats. And now he has turned his sights on the host to say, you invited the wrong people. Wouldn't Jesus be a great dinner guest at your next family party? I mean, some of you know like the cute and cuddly Jesus. It's just not the Jesus of the Bible. I challenge you, read the Bible, you start finding out Jesus, he, he wasn't cute and cuddly. Jesus was the, the kind of, of leader who walked in and said, I'm just going to confront what is wrong before me. I love you. I love you, but I'm not going to let you leave this place without knowing there's a, a better truth. There's something more here that my kingdom is about. And if you miss out on that, you have missed out on it all. And so Jesus is confronting the host, He's now, or the guest. He now turns to the host, and he says, you invited the wrong people. Instead, you would have been better off inviting people who, like, can't pay you back. Somehow, this, this Pharisee has ended up in this, this routine of inviting people over that are going to invite him over next Sabbath day. And so the party, the social or, or, you know, organization is kind of going around and everybody is enjoying their time. And if you can't participate in that, that's cool. You go do you, boo. We're just going to keep serving ourselves with each other. Verse 11, for all those who exalt themselves, I'm sorry, I jumped, up, jumped down. Verse 13, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, man, in my kingdom, our our, our comfort goes down, our compassion goes up. We look for those who are in need, and we welcome them to the table. God is then able to work in this, this place where we're serving the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. And now people who seem like they're on the outskirts, people who seem like they're marginalized and left out, they get included. And Jesus says, this is what my kingdom is like. And then we will be repaid by God at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, I think this is a little moment in the dinner where things get a little awkward Probably Jesus takes a break here. This is not in the Bible. This is the Ben Rainey version, all right? Takes a little sip. Because he's just insulted the host (laughs) and all the guests. And things are probably quiet. It's like Jesus dropped the mic moment. (laughs) 
Silence is awkward. Have you ever noticed that? We, we don't really like silence. Sometimes if I take a break, things are just quiet in the room. People get uncomfortable. Now, you might imagine looking at this in a meeting. If nothing's being said, you... I don't know. I had a meeting with Pastor Greg once. And Ten minutes in, we're just going to be a five-hour interview, an assessment interview, whether he should start a new church. He comes in. It's my first one where I'm the lead assessor, church planting. He, he sits down across the table. Within ten minutes, he tells me, I don't really think God wants me to start a church. I'm like, this is going to be a long day. <laughs> Actually, I'm so thankful. Through that conversation, he starts telling me, like, but I, I think a church should be like this, and I think a church community should be like this, and I think people should act like this, and they, they should engage their community like this. And now all these years later to watch what you and Heather have done in leading this church, I just, I'm so thankful for God's handle on you and, and the way you've yielded yourself to all of that. But I asked some questions that day that probably led to some quiet moments, and it's like uncomfortable. And that's where Sister Reva comes in. I don't know if your church has a Sister Reva. Where I came from, a Sister Reva, she sat kind of towards the back of the church. She, she would get blessed by God. She starts squealing sometimes. It was cool. And, uh, but she also carried this purse. It was a large purse. <laughs> and sometimes she would start digging down. In the quietness of the church service, she would start digging down in there. And she would pull out those little candies that are wrapped in the clear plastic with the twists, you know. And she'd start tapping me on the shoulder and be like, you want one of these, hun? You want one of these, hun? See, I grew up in Glen Burnie, so I know a little bit about the hun, you know. And so, you want one of these, hun? Sure, sure. sure. And so I would, I would try to sit next to Miss Reva sometimes so I could get a little candy. It tastes like menthol, you know what I'm talking about? But it's a, yeah. And, and there in the quietness, you start unwrapping it, and it's like crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. You know what I'm talking, you know that noise? You know that sound? Werther's Originals came along, changed my life. Sister Reva started carrying, but in the silence, it's a little awkward. You can start hearing those, you ever have those people that are like, uh, you know, they're like, uh, amen, pass. Some people are amen people, right? And then there's the guy that's like, mmm, you have any, mmm, I'm that guy. <laughs> a profound moment, mmm, I don't know what that means, but I just like want to do something because it's quiet, mmm, it's very spiritual. Some of you need to take that next step in your spiritual walk. Mmm, Pastor Greg's welcoming it. He wants, mmm. <laughs> we got one of those guys in this story. Everybody's quiet. People are insulted. Verse 15, when one of the table, one of those at the table heard him say this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Right, Jesus? <laughs> ah. I mean, he wants, look, this guy's a middle child, all right? I'm a middle child, a bridge builder, all right? We just try to help the family get along, and we, like, we're just going to try to heal things over right now. This guy's looking at this situation. He's been watching the, the meeting like this. Jesus is talking to the guests. They did the wrong thing. He's looking at Jesus talking to the host. He did the wrong thing, and he is just, like, uncomfortable, and Jesus is taking a break, and everything's quiet, but this guy is going to save the moment, He's going to bring it all back. He's going to get us back on track. Well, we're all going to be blessed at the feast in the kingdom of God. You just said we invited the wrong people to this feast, and we took the wrong seats at this feast, but we'll have a chance, Jesus, to get it right at the end of time, right at the kingdom of God. It's all going to get set straight. But this guy has no idea who he's talking to. He is, he's talking about a feast where they will eat one day together in the feast of the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You're talking about eating at some feast? And yet the feast of the kingdom of God is sitting right in front of you saying you can come close to God through me and you want to talk about some feast in your theology? Let's talk about right now. Let's talk about this moment where an invitation is sitting right in front of you and calling you to a relationship with God. Let's talk about that. Verse 16, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. 
At that time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all, all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. I love this guy, the newlywed. No, please excuse me. I just got married. I can't come. And the servant came back, verse 21, to report this to his master. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Anybody notice a theme of Jesus here? Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Somebody say, there is still room. There's still room. And the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes, compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to taste of my banquet. Now, there's no, there's no phones, there's no text messages that, that the dinner is ready, no evites, right? You just cook the meal, and when it was ready, the servants in the house who've been working hard all day to try to make this ready, they, 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 and th this servant really seems to love his master, goes out and starts knocking on doors to say, hey, everything is ready. My master invites you to come. And they come up with these excuses, man. Everybody's got excuses. I just bought a piece of property. I need to go see it. Listen, can you take it from your secretary treasurer? That's bad business. Buying a piece of property you've never seen. Don't do that. Don't, I did that. I actually literally did that once leading up to 2008. I almost got creamed because of that. But God, God spared me somehow. God spared me on a no-doc loan and blah, blah. I don't have time for all that. Don't do that. It's stupid. This is the excuse. I bought a piece of property. I got to go see it. Is something changing about the property between today and tomorrow? Isn't it going to be there? Same parcel of land. Isn't it going to be there tomorrow? Why are, why are you so uh, stupid to buy a piece of property you haven't seen yet? I say that to myself. If you've done that, I've, I bless your idiocy in the way that I, the way I bless my own shortcomings, right? The next guy says, I got to test drive my oxen. Got five yoke of oxen. I've never, I've never seen an oxen. Ah, an ox. Never seen the ox is o oxen. <laughs> but if I did... I'm pretty sure they just look like big, large animals that walk in a straight line. That's what they did. And you can pretty much, look, I'm no farmer, but I can pretty much look at an ox and be like, that's a big ox. That's a big, strong ox. I bought 10 of them yesterday. I got to go see if they're really oxen. Yes, they're oxen. They eat and they walk. That's what they do. And they will do it tomorrow. Why are you rejecting this invitation when the meal is ready now? They got excuses. And then finally, this guy, he says, I, look, my problem is I just got married. I can't come. He's actually quoting the Old Testament law here. In Deuteronomy 24, 5, it says, If a man is recently married, he must not be sent off to war, have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. I mean, couldn't we bring this one back? Wouldn't that, like, let's just take a year after we get married to figure out how to love our wives and make her happy. Ladies, wouldn't this change your life if you could have a year to have whipped them into shape, right? Men, wouldn't it help you if you had a year to figure out how to make her happy? Like this, God knew what he was doing back here. I can't come because I just got married. Buddy, here's how you could make her happy. Accept a free meal so she doesn't have to spend the time in the kitchen tonight cooking. Learn how to make your wife happy, but no, he can't come. And the servant comes back and reports it and then is told, go out to the streets and the alleys of town, find everybody you can, poor, crippled, blind, lame, bring them in. So the servant goes out and does that, and then the servant looks around. Verse 22, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. It's not the master who looks around and says there's still room. The servant has taken responsibility for what's going on here and says, sir, 
there's still room. And the master said, then go outside of town. Go out to the country lanes and byways and compel them to come in. I love the heart of the servant. This is what really arrested me. And over this year, as I've been meditating in this passage, I, I realize how often I'm like the, the guests who try to jockey for position, how much I try to put myself in a positive light so somehow I can be esteemed in the eyes of men. And I've been challenged to say, Lord, am I humbling myself so I can be esteemed in your eyes? I look at my level of compassion and I say, how much am I just interested in my own comfort? rather than the increasing compassion of God who is looking for those who are far from him. And I look at this servant and I ask, am I so compelled with the gift of my master and the invitation that has gone out that I look around and say, but Lord, there's still room. There's still room. And what am I doing about it? So as we wrap this up, just three things you may want to jot them down to think about later this week. Number one, the excuses there are excuses for many guests. I mean, all kinds of people make excuses. Even today, the invitation of God is sitting right in front of you. He is reaching right out to you, speaking to you right now. And there will be people who have excuses, and they'll say, man, I'm not ready yet. Uh, it's not time. I don't have time to dedicate to that. Like, I'm really involved in my work, or, or I'm, my kids are young, and I'm really tied up in all that stuff. I just can't get there. Some people are like, man, God doesn't want me because I know like all my list of like the things I do wrong. And so like when I get my stuff together, then he'll love me. I can kind of measure up to what he's looking for. But right now I'm not. And Jesus is saying, man, the invitation is coming out. The invitation is coming out to you. I'm calling you right now. Will you come into a relationship with me? Will you join the feast of the bread of life in Jesus that says my life is dedicated to you? But man, we got excuses. I'm praying that today somebody stops the excuses. Somebody says, no more excuses, Lord. No more waiting around. No more trying to get this all in order. If you say you love me and you say you'll receive me, then here's my life. I come to you. There are excuses for many guests. Number two, there is work for the servants. Man, some of us find ourselves already in a relationship with Jesus. We have come to know what that feast is like. We know what the celebration is about. But we carry the message of invitation to others. We're the ones who look around the room and say, there's still room. Somebody's looking around right now at, at the empty seats in this building and saying, there's still room. Somebody should be. Somebody should be thinking about loved ones and family members who are far from God and thinking, man, there's still room right here for them. There's a way. Somebody's thinking about a fall fair that's coming up next week, and you're saying, how can we do this harvest fair in a way that reaches people and brings them to Jesus? Man, there's still room. There's still room on the ponies. There's still room in the games. There's still room. And I'm not going to be settled until I'm participating to help fill the house. There's work for the servants. And finally... There's room for more at the feast. So right now, whether you've been making excuses or whether you're compelled to bring others in, we come to this moment where we say God is speaking. This has a house where God speaks. And through his word, he's been speaking to you. And I want to give you a moment to respond to him. Would you bow your heads with me in the presence of God? Because I believe right now there's room at the feast. And some of you, some of you need to respond to his invitation. And I know this story Jesus told, this parable, he's, he's kind of using a metaphor of this feast. But really what he's saying is, I want a relationship with you. I want to make all things right between you and me. I want to make a way for you to be reconciled with God. Everything's square as he receives you, and so much so that Jesus came to give his own life so that we could come close to God. I wonder, is there someone in the house today who says, I need to respond to the invitation of God? No more excuses. God, here I am. If you love me enough to invite me to a relationship with you, I just stop resisting you, and I say, God, would you come into my life? If that's you, would you raise your hand up and look up at me or... Our heads are bowed, but anybody today who wants to respond to God in that way, I want to pray for you. Pastor, I want to respond to God and say, God, here's my life. I want to be made right with you. If that's you, would you raise your hand and look up at me? I want to pray for you. Anyone today? I want to pray for those today also who find themselves 
jockeying for position and trying to earn the, the eyes of the world rather than being fo- focused on the eyes of God. And right now you say, you know what, I, I'm not humbling myself. I'm trying to exalt myself. But God's speaking to me and I need to change that direction. And some of you are saying, I need to change direction in the way I have compassion for others. Would you pray for me? If, if that's been speaking to you this morning, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you today to, to say, God, I want to redirect my life. I've been following you, but I want to make sure that I'm getting it right. I want to humble myself so that you can lift me up. I, I want to reach out to others that can come close to you in your compassion. Lord, I pray for this congregation, Lord, and those that are hearing this word, those online that are, that are watching this message that you're speaking to, and, and you're challenging us the same way you challenged the Pharisees and experts in the law at this meal. And I pray that we wouldn't miss out on all that you desire for us. So, Lord, I pray, would you help us? Would you help us to respond to you? Would you help us to know you more? And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know the, the prayer team is going to be available here today. If, you, if you've been stirred by this message, I want to invite you up to this side of the, the, the altar area to pray with you. Some of you just need a few moments with Jesus. You can come up to the altar and spend that together. But we're going to worship the Lord and allow God to continue to stir the word that he has shared. Amen. Amen. If you could please stand. And again prayer team, if you can come up and the altar is open.
This is worship. It's this symbolism of our worship, of our song that we sing to the Lord. And so day and night, night and day, let the incense arise. This is our song. If we can all sing this together today. Here we go. thank you today for your presence we thank you today God that you are who you say you are we thank you that for salvation God we thank you for forgiveness we thank you for mercy we thank you for your grace we thank you for all the good things God we believe that every good thing we have comes straight from you God the paper trail always leads to you and we thank you for that so God we just we just ask that you would continue to move in our hearts this week God let the fire of our heart the burning embers God, I pray that this week we would do the things that would only let that fire burn stronger, God. I pray that we would, we would watch ourselves of what goes into our temples, God, so that you can grow and, and build us into what you want us to become. And God, I pray that you would put a passion in our hearts for those that are not seated at the table. God, that it breaks our hearts 
with compassion. God, it breaks our hearts. Let us be a, a church with, with a heart that's broken for the lost. God, let that be. I just pray that this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us have a break our hearts for the lost, God. God, help us not to focus on ourselves any longer. But God, help us to focus on those that if today their life ended, they would go to hell, God. I pray that in Jesus' name. And God, I pray that you bless every person in this room. God, heal the sick. God, bring life to homes that are lifeless today, God. Those marriages that are hanging on by a thread, God, I speak life to them. God, bless people this week that are looking for a new job or maybe transitioning in a job. God, give them your wisdom, your knowledge, God. And God, I just pray that you would do a great work in this body this week. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. God is good. Amen. Before you go, two things. Um, first thing, if you're new to the church, you've never been here before, please stop off at the Connect Center. Uh, we have. A, we want to give you a, a, who likes coffee? Really? Okay. Well, don't take it then. It's your loss. Um, we want to give you a Dunkin' Donuts card and a gift bag of some information on our church. But you have to stop off at the Connect Center to get it and fill a card out for us. Number two, if you would uh, like to join us and you say, I still haven't planned to help with the Harvest Fair, we still need some help. Because we're expecting God to do great things here Saturday. Amen? So if you're either way, if you haven't decided yet, or you're on the fence, well, I want to push you to this side of the fence in Jesus' name. Uh, but I would encourage you, uh, stop at the prayer uh, room, which is right there. You'll see it. It's a five-minute meeting. If you could give us five minutes of your time just so Madison could share the vision and what your role would be, we would love it. Other than that, invite somebody with you next week. Have a great day. Uh, Jesus is awesome. Amen? Amen. Have a great day.